Welcome to Respect the Dead, the podcast where we don't. Betty, it's no surprise that everyone celebrated your. I was totally bopping to this the other day, listening to the, the newest episode. I was just like, thanks, guys. It's so don't you the first and probably the only song I'll ever write. <laughs> sleep in your sodden bed. It's time. Uh, <laughs> so I appreciate it. So, uh, hey guys, um, for this episode, I'm going to be walking a very fine line because the entire conceit of this show is disrespect for the dead because the dead can't hear or be hurt by the things we say about them. But the subject of this episode is notably reprehensible for the ways he treated a corpse. So I stand by my commitment to shit talking dead people, but I would invite my co-hosts and all of our listeners to consider the ways abuses of corpses can be a violation of a person's bodily autonomy, to consider who most often gets stripped of that autonomy and why, and to consider what role the consent of a dying person plays in the handling of their body post-mortem. And to that point, a brief content warning up front that there's going to be some graphic discussion of decomposition. And if that's upsetting for you and you're not Mandy or Kaylin, <laughs> now would be a good time to skip the episode. <laughs> you guys are locked in. <laughs> that was such a nice little thing. I like that. That was really good. Hoots. I mean, it was very considerate, but also... Thanks. Equally ominous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's get into it. Um, the episode, uh, the subject of my episode today is Carl Tanzler. Uh, so Carl Tanzler was born on February 8th, 1877 in Dresden, Germany. He claimed to be a count and to have grown up in a castle, but that probably isn't true. <laughs> he claimed that as a young boy, he was visited by the ghost of an 18th century ancestor of his named Countess Anna Cossel, or Cosell. I think it's Cosell. And I want to note that the story of the haunting uh, was relayed in the memoir he wrote after the events of today's story. And in tellings of this story, the haunting is usually just presented without comment. So I want to say, like, I want to leave my own commentary that I don't think there is any evidence that he talked about this haunting by Countess Anna Cassell prior to the publishing of his story. And I'm pretty suspicious that it's a detail that was retrofitted into his life to support his later actions. Mm. But that is just my yeah. perspective. I am not a historian and I have not studied this uh, story in, you know, great. I, I didn't get my PhD in Carl fucking Tanzler. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't think you need it because either way, <clears throat> The story wasn't true. I mean, yeah, like, I, I, there's a lot of like, <laughs> so we're going to be talking about a guy who um, clearly there, there was something going on with him mentally, like he was mentally disturbed okay. in certain ways. The extent of that is um, lost to the sands of time. And my personal feelings about it is... I, I feel like he maybe exaggerated some of uh, uh, some claims of having delusions or or seeing visions in order to support uh, some pretty fucked up things that he did. Okay. But that is just my feelings. Yeah. At the age of 12, Carl had a dream about his ghost countess, ca ghost countess, the first of many visions he would claim to have uh, of her throughout his life. He claimed that the countess had an interest in alchemy. And so he too became interested in science, quote unquote, above all other things. He didn't smoke or drink and he showed little interest in girls as he grew up, but uh, he, he liked to tinker with things. Mm -hmm. He liked to, to play around with with things. Mm -hmm. uh, and he claimed to have an earned master's degrees in mathematics, physics, medicine, philosophy, and chemistry by the time he was 24. <laughs> so he had a lot of spare time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. During this time, the ghost of the countess continued to visit Carl, eventually showing him a vision of the woman he was destined to be with, a beautiful woman with long, dark hair. 
As a young man, he traveled throughout Europe at one point to Genoa, where he encountered a statue that he claimed looked like the promised beloved, which sat atop a grave of a woman named Elena, who died at the age of 22. Carl claimed to have been so moved by the image of the statue that he wept and repeated the name Elena, Elena, Elena over and over until a spirit emerged from the statue and made eye contact with him. And he followed the spirit, but she disappeared into a crowd. So during the first, this is very Bloody Mary. It, yeah, like, he repeats Bloody her Mary name mythos, like, until she appears. Yeah, like okay, yeah. it seems easy to get a ghost. Then why are we buying Ouija boards? Mm, like, right? what a waste of money. Yeah, so much easier. So Carl, uh, during the First World War, uh, he spent some time in an internment camp in Australia. So oh, he was German, yeah. and he he was interned in Australia, and he did settle in Australia for a short time following the war, maybe working as an electrical engineer. This is unclear, and he claimed during that time that the beautiful ghost returned to him and lived with him for seven days. He didn't know her name, even though she was buried under a grave that said Elena. So he called... And he said her name? Yeah. Like Apparently, when she came back, he was like, I'm not sure of your name. Uh, so I'm going to call you Aisha. He was like so making he her? her Aisha. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know her. <laughs> uh, she's just been following me around. <laughs> uh, sorry, what's your name? Um, anyway, so she stayed with him for seven days and he called her Aisha. Mm-hmm. And to quote him, there was an incorporeal love between us, which approached the divine. Mm. Uh, but then she left after a week. <laughs> uh, so he returned to Germany in 1920, where he married a woman named Doris Schaefer, with which he had two children. One of them was named Aisha, after okay. what he called the ghost. Okay. Um, and another, another y'all, was named Clarista, who was sometimes also referred to in accounts as Krista. <gasps> Krista! Krista! <laughs> <laughs> So we know she was a bitch. Yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent unredeemable. <laughs> I stand Krista Tanzler so hard. <laughs> that bitch. Uh, so in 1926, uh, he abandoned his family and went to Cuba. For the bit. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> he was like, Krista seems like kind of a bitch. I'm, I'm getting the hell out of Dodge. All right, I'm heading My out. My four year old. <laughs> Like, whatever you uh, think, kids, I just need you to know this is your fault. <laughs> so he was like Peter Sellers in that respect. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like I loved your, I love your mother very much, but the kids, you, Christy, you, Christy, you're the reason I'm leaving. I don't love you, Krista. <laughs> you're you're, you're the a genuinely problem. bad person. Um, <laughs> none of this is true, everybody. This is just our fan theory because Kristas are all bitches. Um, <laughs> so he went to Havana for a little while, uh, but he finally relocated to Zephyr Hills, Florida, where his sister already lived and owned property. Hmm. And in 1927, about a year later, he took a job as a radiologist and basically like an orderly um, at the U.S. Marine Hospital in Key West. So by this time, he went by the moniker Dr. Count Carl von Kosel. (laughs) (laughs) Can you you say that again? Can you say that a second time, please? I just want to. He was he was the doctor count, again. Mandy. He was he was the doctor count, Carl von Kosel. The, <laughs> the doctor count. The doctor count. You know, that's not a real yeah, doctor that's count. Sounds, that's like something that a child like comes something. up yeah. with. Like I'm a doctor count. <laughs> <laughs> my nephews would come up with that. I am literally going to change my Twitter handle to <laughs> doctor count Amanda von Hootman. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, he always wore a white suit and took a silver tipped cane with him everywhere he went. And I'm going to send you oh a little little cheeky image oh, of yes. him right now. Yes. Um, I'm going to drop it in the chat. Oh, I can't wait. He looks exactly the way you're imagining him right now. Bam, bam, bam. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> oh. oh, wow. Yeah, he. he That's him. He, okay. He looks like he knows ghosts. Yeah. He looks like <laughs> what would happen if you Googled search the image old man with glasses. Yeah. Um, I like it's just <laughs> he looks like an old man who wears a suit everywhere. Yeah. He he looks like a ghost. He too. does with a silver yeah. tipped cane. Yeah. I really, that's exactly what I expected him to look like. <laughs> I, I mean, why would you put the silver on? On, on the tip? I don't know. But that was a thing. Do you want the silver running around the on the ground? 
That was a thing in the 1920s. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people had like little tipped canes. It was like such a, um, yeah, it was like a fashion statement. Yeah. So he acquired a broken down airplane that he left in a parking spot on the hospital property and spent his free time trying to fix it up. Like total Florida guy vibes. <laughs> that is a Florida guy thing. You get like either a boat that will never <laughs> see the ocean again or a small seaplane and you just spend your entire life fixing it up and it never gets fixed up. Like, like in the hospital parking lot too. Yeah. You just like pull in mm-hmm. and there's a fucking plane. <laughs> he worked at the hospital and he was like, I'm just going to leave this here. I'm going to fix it on my lunch breaks. I'll move it when it's done. Oh my God. Him eating lunch alone in his plane every yeah. day. <laughs> Cause he has no friends. A little Cuban sandwich. <laughs> yeah. So- I'm picturing like a plane with like a, you know, like the little bubble UFO. Yes. Top. <laughs> where you can just like it's like a 360 oh, view yeah. i just picture like the little snoopy plane vibe where it's just like you're just sitting there i've actually i've got a picture of the plane if you want to see it of course i do yeah i want to see it i was going to show it to you a little bit later but i will show it to you now yeah we're ready show me time drop that in the chat it's actually kind of cute <laughs> wow oh. what the fuck is that <laughs> Man, it looks like a prop <laughs> in a, in a like, play or something. Isn't it, it cute? Looks, what it the does. Fuck? Made by five year olds with construction what paper. Lit- yes. who, five year olds who have so never cute. seen a plane, mind you. <laughs> Like it looks, it looks like a fish. It kind of looks like a plane. It looks a at one like point, a plane. it was a real sort plane. Of. Where at one point it was a real plane, and he fixed it up. I'm um, crying. It, I oh mean, it, I don't think it ever flew again. He didn't oh, actually fix so it up. Funny. So uh, okay, where was I? A paper plane. Paper plane. Okay. He also, around this time, claimed to have discovered and thus owned an island in the South Seas near where Amelia Earhart's plane went down. Is that how islands work? So he was like, I've got it. (laughs) He just dibs it? Yeah. He was like, oh, yeah. I was like, I found this island and it's mine. Dibs. It's, uh, you know, the unsolved mystery of Amelia Earhart? Earhart? Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart. I'm like, how aptly named. (laughs) They should have known. <laughs> what if what if he said that though? <laughs> you know the mystery of Amelia Earhart? It's like near where she is. <laughs> it's like you know, the woman yeah. who disappeared. <laughs> the woman who disappeared and whose body has never been found. It's right by there. Uh, yeah. It's right by there. It's right by there. <laughs> That's where my island is. So uh, what I'm trying to establish here is this guy is a liar. Oh, 100 percent Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting that vibe. <laughs> So in April of 1930, while working at the Marine Hospital, Carl was asked to draw the blood of a young patient, Maria Elena Milagros de Hoyos. She was described by those who knew her as beautiful with long, dark hair and a sweet singing voice. Uh, And she came from a family of poor Cuban immigrants and her father worked in a cigar factory. And I'm going to send you a picture of her. And basically, he immediately became convinced that she was the the Elena ghost uh, that was promised to him as his bride. No. Oh, no. I'm going to send you a picture. That's Maria Elena Milagros de Hoyos. Oh, she's pretty. She's gorgeous. She's gorgeous. Uh, She's like transition goals. She's beautiful. Look at that hair. Unbelievably beautiful. Beautiful hair. Yeah, if I saw her, I'd be like, yeah, obviously I'm destined to be with her. Obviously. I'm in love with her. (laughs) (laughs) How old was he at this time? Carl was 53 years old and Elena was 12. Jesus. Yep. Gross. Uh, Elena had... And her doctor. And, well... An orderly at the hospital. He wasn't even a... Oh, okay. He claimed Sorry. to be a doctor. He claimed to have a doctor in medicine. <laughs> Account <a> orderly. <laughs> but my boy was... Poly- he was a, he was a drawing blood and taking early x-rays in the very early era of like radiology okay. and mm-hmm. x-rays, imaging. So he was an orderly. So Elena was diagnosed with tuberculosis, which was often still a death sentence, even in the 1930s. And at the time, it was the number one cause of death in Key West. Elena was also married. She had been married at the age of 18. And actually, her illness came kind of at the end of a miscarriage that she had had. At first, they were like, her family just thought she was suffering from like, kind of 
postpartum depression, although I guess not postpartum because she didn't, you know, the, the kind of depression that you have after you have a miscarriage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it turned out that it was, it was more than that uh, when she started to get a cough. Mm. So uh, she, uh, she was already married, but her husband abandoned her sometime after her TB diagnosis. He oh. was just like, oh, you're going to die? Okay, peace. Wow. Oh, nice. Fuck him. Yeah, real piece of shit. <sighs> Carl also a piece of shit, threw himself into trying to save Elena, treating her with radiation as well as fruit. He, he just got her a lot of fruit. He's like, have some vitamin C. She doesn't have scurvy, you idiot. Here's an orange for your cancer. And some church wine. Church wine? Yeah. He, he also got some wine from a church and was like, here, drink this. It so he couldn't even get good wine? Yeah, like. he got the <laughs> shitty wine. It's not from all right. Wine. Can one have cancer if one is wasted? Yes. <laughs> it's good to you. So I, I did call him a piece of shit just there. He wasn't a piece of shit for wanting to cure her. He was a piece of shit because the reason he wanted to cure her was fully selfish. Yeah. Like yeah. he often talked about curing her, marrying her, and then flying her away to his island in the South Seas on the plane that he was working on. He's like, I'm going to fix this up. I'm going to fix you. And then I'm going to marry you and take you to my island where Amelia Earhart is buried. Like the <laughs> the level of like dehumanization to just like make someone mm. part of your like, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, she's life goals now. My midlife crisis, honey. Like I'm just gonna, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're just gonna, we're gonna fix you up. We're gonna get in my paper plane. Mm -hmm. We're gonna fly to my magic island. Mm -hmm. Recalling like, Elena's visits to the hospital, Carl wrote, we took the time out to inspect the plane together. Those moments were of great delight to both of us. We sat side by side in the little pilot cabin and imagined how it would be when it carried us into the air and across the ocean. He would often propose to her and she would often turn him down saying he was old enough to be her grandfather. <laughs> in a letter to Elena, Carl wrote, so often you have said, I am too old for you, but listen, darling, I never count my years, neither do I count yours. If you were a mummy 5,000 years old, I would marry you just the same. I swear it's not for selfish reasons that I want this marriage because I can do so much more than a boy your age. I can offer you my science, my experience, my capacity to save your life, and this apart and on top of my undying love. You want to get well, don't you? And you want to see the world, don't you? I hate him. What a oh fucking my God. monster. It, it started off with him. Calling. Number one, I would still want to marry you if you were a mummy, but it's like, but mummy doesn't want to marry you. Mm -hmm. Like, it's uh, not. <laughs> I would marry you if oh. you were old. You should want to marry me if, <laughs> because I'm old. Like, because we're She's meant like, to yeah, be together. She's like, yeah, I would still be hot. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be a hot, famous mummy. <laughs> like In this hypothetical situation where you're really old and ugly, I would still love you. You can't prove that I wouldn't. <laughs> it's so goddamn condescending. <laughs> Don't you want to get better? Oh I can God. fix you. It's the... <sighs> That that that's the one yeah. that gets me. It's the very end. It's this very almost implied threat of like, well, if you don't accept my help and my love, then mm -hmm. who knows I, what's going to happen to you? I don't think it was implied. Like, I think he said it twice. <laughs> you, <laughs> like, well, like he yeah. outright said it twice. Yeah, it's so <laughs> like, fucking don't creepy. you want to get better? Yeah, don't you want to see the so world? Creepy. Then marry me. Yeah. yeah, like not even date me. Like full on marry me. And Ugh. he was trying to Ew. cure her with like wine and fruit. Yeah, like literally, like uh, this bitch is not going to get over her to because you made her a sangria yeah. sweaty. Yeah. Like this literally like <laughs> sangria and fucking x-rays. He was like, let me give you a dose of radiation and get you drunk. I I yeah, I doubt he was using any sort of like proper lead. What year yeah. was this? Oh honey, no, like, this was 1930. Yeah, absolutely not. He was pouring radiation into her, like yeah. just radiation and sangria down her throat. Oh, my girl was going home glowing like a fucking lightning bug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of my favorite details in this just <laughs> kind of walking a little crisscrossed. Yeah. She's like I've noticed these Sorry. growths. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> That's my love for you. <laughs> Carl would sign, one of my favorite details is Carl would sign his letters, eternally yours, Carl von Kosel, and Elena would, Elena would sign her letters, your friend, Elena. <laughs> <laughs> So he's just like going, like, oh, I love you, and I love this, and, and I'm going to love you if you're a mummy. And she's like, 
Okay, thanks. <laughs> you have been friend zoned. Yeah, uh, that, that's <laughs> like, oh my god, so that's hard. so nice. Thank you, Carl. What a great friend thing to say. <laughs> Mummies are yeah. cool, aren't they? <laughs> Mummies. So uh, Elena's family were kind of freaked out by Carl. Uh, yeah, as they should. And Carl uh, characterized them. He, in his writings, in his memoirs about the story, um, he characterized them as distrustful of science and standing in the way of her treatment because they tried to limit her time with him. But again, this is my uh, commentary. I think they were just like this 53-year-old man that's super obsessed with our 20-year-old daughter is really yeah. freaking yeah. us out. Yeah, exactly. That's how I would feel. Jesus. I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, no, you're weird and creepy. Get away from my daughter. Yeah. We don't have any of their, like, uh, we don't know their side of the story. Yeah. We only have, like, his writing about it. So it's, like, very one-sided. But I'm just putting myself in the place of her... Poor little factory, cigar factory dad, who's probably like, yeah. please get away from my married 20-year-old daughter who's dying of tuberculosis, yeah. you fucking freak. Yeah. So, yeah. When Carl wrote a letter to Elena about – a, so Carl had a lot of dreams about Elena. Um, and he wrote a letter to her about a dream he had had about her. Oh, God. Elena's sister visited Carl at the hospital and told him, dream no more. <laughs> so <laughs> I like her sister. Hey, she was like, Your dreams are fucking weird and creepy. Mm -hmm. Stop it. And Elena's family actually eventually moved and they and their former neighbors refused to disclose their new address to Carl Good. because he was like fully Elena's stalker at this point. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah. But eventually a well meaning friend of the family shared their new address with him and <sighs> uh and, and he found them. He found them again. At this point, uh Elena was so sick that all of the real doctors in her life were basically just giving Elena palliative care. They were like making her comfortable and yeah. giving her painkillers because they were like, you're, you're going to die. Like this is, mm -hmm. this is past the point of no return. But Carl convinced Elena's family that she could still be saved and that he was the only one who could do it. So they let him back in their lives to try no. and treat her. His no. treatments included, again, this man is not a real doctor. No. This, he claims to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. This is, you know how everyone has that one thing where they're like, that one thing that just fucking gets to them. Yeah. People offering false hope to sick people in their family mm -hmm. just is the yep. one, is that that's my thing. It just gets yeah, me it, more mm -hmm. than anything else. And I want to <sighs> wring his scrawny little fucking neck. What I hate. Yeah. Oh. I want to beat him with this. <laughs> I want to beat him with his own cane. Yeah. Like that's just, so, it's just so extra scummy. I want to run him over with that plane. Like, <laughs> cause like I, I can't even sit here and judge them because of course they were like, well, this, this one, you have a chance. Like who knows what they were going through you have a chance maybe you don't have a lot of, i don't know how much money you know the dad was making at a cigar factor and your 20 year old daughter your beautiful 20 year old daughter is dying, yeah. dying. If he can like, save her they can move again yeah and you like, have this one guy <sighs> yeah it's it's so hard and i feel so bad for them they they did not think like they're ruining the last days of her mm -hmm. life right by forcing this man back on her. well i don't know maybe she she agreed to it Maybe. but like that's not you're never in those moments you're never agree, you're no. not actually consenting right you're desperate when you're fucking dying and yeah. somebody lies to you and offers you care that's not actual consent like that is under right. duress you're, it, it's a power imbalance because 100%. they're yeah 100 mm -hmm. yeah sorry, okay no 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 i'm right there with you i don't i don't know i don't think this makes it any better or any worse it's just like neutral but he it, it, most of the time when people do that kind of thing there is like a financial incentive mm -hmm. they're scamming yeah. people out of money i will say he's doing all of this for free because yeah he is obsessed with her like he wants her to live yeah well it doesn't make it like any better. monetarily free yeah monetarily like, free he's, he's doing it for the love <laughs> he's, of he's her, getting his but, jollies yeah. yeah it's because he he plans on marrying her right yeah so yeah. His treatments included throat sprays with gold dissolved into them. Oh my fucking God. For some reason. And painful electrical shocks from a resonant transformer, a.k.a. a Tesla coil, that he yeah. would administer to her repeatedly until she cried out in pain. Yeah. Torture. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he was, he was torturing a dying woman. He's torturing her. Nobody's ever up. needed a gold throat. Yeah. Like, I know, I know we make a lot of glug glug jokes on this podcast and like maybe the golden throat is something I would put on a t-shirt, but like, like at no point in 
at, at any point in like any medical care, do you need to be like putting any like precious metals in somebody's throat? Like what yeah. was the idea behind that? The tuberculosis can't get through the metal. It's already in yeah. her body. Like this is like completely anti-science way yeah, of thinking right. about yeah, things. Of, like it. He had no idea what, what the fuck he was doing. I think like, all. you know how, like he said the, the ghost of the countess was interested in alchemy mm-hmm. and that's like why he was interested in science. I think he thinks that alchemy is <gasps> oh, science. So I think he's yeah. like, I'll just, I'll put some gold leaf in okay. your mouth. Well now, uh, well, now a lot more makes sense. I'll put some gold leaf in your mouth yeah. and it'll heal you. And this is like okay. fully the 1930s. Now that I know it's witchcraft. like Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this is like fully the 1930s. So we actually do have like medicine. Oh, um, yeah. And, yeah. and people know like what causes tuberculosis and like yeah. people yeah. It, there, there just isn't a treatment for it at the, i mean there are treatments uh and it can be survived but there's not like a cure for yeah it. like we already had we already had germ theory and like a knowledge mm-hmm. of viruses uh-huh. like by this point like that is not there's no excuse yeah mm. so she had been treated by real doctor it, basically at the same time it, it's like certain cancers are nowadays where like yeah if you catch it early enough yeah certain treatments you can you can effectively yeah. cure yourself of the cancer but there isn't like a quote-unquote yeah. cure there's not a vaccine yeah. so she was being treated by real doctors and by real doctors who determined like she has passed that like whatever the stage point is of no return where like we just need to make her comfortable yeah but he he was gonna just like shove gold in her mouth and also shock her and torture her with um electrical currents at the same time because he's not a real doctor yeah jesus i think the gold was supposed to, the gold throat spray, spray was supposed to treat her cough and then he thought the electrical currents would cure her oh i was like is he trying to make her like conductive or something like what is this i'm trying to use logic uh to yeah. describe alchemy and that's a <laughs> mistake <laughs> according to carl at this time elena said according to carl yeah if i must die All I can leave you is my body, for I am only a sickly girl. So I cannot marry you while I am sick, but you will take care of my body after I am dead, won't you? And he considered that to be their marriage vow. Elena died on October 25th, 1931, at the age of 21. Carl swooped in and promised to pay for the funeral, to which her poor grieving family agreed. Piece of shit. At her funeral... He described feeling as though her eyes were gazing into his, even though they were closed at the viewing. Uh, Intellectually, he knew she was dead, but he wrote, My heart, with far greater force, told me she is not dead. Quote, A strange kind of new life now began for me. It was something like a rebirth after the last two oppressing and depressing years. Now at last, nobody could take my Elena away from me. Although I could not see her any longer, I felt her presence all the time. So Elena's family told Carl that they wanted to move from their house as the memories of uh, the suffering Elena were Mm. too painful. And he told them that if they did, he would either rent the house or buy it outright. Uh, They ended up staying and Carl rented Elena's old room from the family for $5 a month. And he wrote, it still preserved the sweet scent of her hair. I'm, Ew. I'm so oh, fucking disturbed by so this cream. Like both of your faces right now. Uh, they're poor, her poor family. Like to have that creepy dude just in your yeah. house, in your dead daughter's room. Her poor family. But you family. can't do anything about it because you need the money probably. Like, oh my God. Oh my God. Uh, I mean, they were not wealthy. Right. They, they, her, her dad was a factory yeah. worker, and I don't think her mom or her sisters even worked. And I'm sure all of her care oh ended up costing them a Cost shit ton a of, lot money of money, too. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. So they were like, "That's uh, okay, I guess we'll just have this creepy guy stay in her room sometimes. It's a horror movie. Then... Carl started to worry about the drainage at the cemetery. He didn't want Elena getting all wet down there in her grave. No. So he personally financed and built her a mausoleum to keep her above ground. No. A mausoleum for which 
Carl had the only key. Absolutely the fuck not. <laughs> when they reinterred her, Carl noted that she had been decaying. It had been like a few months. Um, and the lining of her coffin coffin had fallen down and stuck to her face and body. And he spent hours carefully removing it. Mm. He cleaned and treated the body with preservatives and sprayed it with eau de cologne. He placed Elena in an inner coffin with an incubate with an incubation tank uh, with special solutions similar to formaldehyde in order to preserve her. And he placed the inner coffin inside of an outer coffin within the mausoleum. So she's kind of like, like a mummy in that respect. Yeah. Except like a, like a wet mummy. Yeah. Oh no. Ugh. That's so creepy. It's- yeah. He wants to preserve her. This is what rich people do with money. And it's so disgusting. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, like people should like, Oh, my God. Carl visited Elena's mausoleum daily, often bringing her gifts and eventually even installing a telephone in the mausoleum. <laughs> to what end? <laughs> in, case she, in case she needed to make any calls, you know? <laughs> Who's he going to call? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it's like, um, just you can only use it after 6 p.m. Mm-hmm. or on weekends. Otherwise they charge you. Because I, I, yeah. it's pay yeah. as you go, sweaty. <laughs> So then after 18 months of visits, Carl claimed Elena started to talk and to sing to him. And she would sing a song called La Barra Negra, which translates to The Black Wedding. Would you like to hear an English translation of the lyrics? Oh, sh- sure. Um, I'm yeah. going to have to now that I know we're I being can. haunted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Listen to the story I was once told by the old grave digger of the region. It was about a lover who, by ungodly luck, had his sweet beloved taken by death. Every night he went to the cemetery to visit the tomb of his sweet beloved. The townspeople secretly whispered that he was a dead man who escaped the pit. On a horrendous night, he shattered to pieces the abandoned marble tomb. He dug the earth and carried in his arms the rigid skeleton of his beloved. And there in the sad and gloomy room, he mourned under a feeble flame. He sat beside her cold and rigid bones and celebrated his wedding with his dead beloved. He tied her bare bones with ribbons. Her her rigid skull he crowned with flowers. He covered her decaying mouth with kisses and proclaimed his love to her with a smile. He took his bride to their soft wedding bed, lying next to her in love, and he remained asleep forever while embracing her rigid skeleton. And he remained asleep forever while embracing her rigid skeleton. Okay. Oh my god, it's... A lot of it was very flowery, but like she really had it to end on rigid skeleton to really drive home the fact that this is a rigid skeleton you're talking about. What a. (laughs) So then, (laughs) Mandy and Kaylin. Nope. Then Elena told Carl that she didn't want to be in her tomb anymore and she wanted to go home with him. Oh, well, she said it. So since I, she said it, it's everything that I'm sure it's about to follow. Like, I'm fine. sorry, but I'm... Uh, <laughs> after she sang that song to him, she told him she didn't want to be there anymore. She was done. I'm like 90% sure um, that this is the plot of like in season four of Riverdale at some point. <laughs> it could be. It could be based on this. This is a very famous story in Florida specifically, uh, which we'll get to. So Carl, dressed in his wedding suit, nope. came back to the cemetery on an evening of a new moon so that he would not be seen by any of the cemetery's neighbors. And he took the inner coffin, placed it on a wagon, and covered it in a blanket. So the outer coffin is still in the mausoleum and looks like she's buried yeah, there and, still. Yeah. And now he has the, the little the little wet tube. Mm-hmm. As he lifted the coffin over the cemetery fence, uh, one of the incubation tanks, <laughs> valves sprung a leak and fluids dripped down on top of him. <laughs> uh, he describes he describes taking the corpse uh from the uh from the mausoleum as as thus. All of the cemetery was alive with souls, which came out of the graves from all sides, moving and thronging around us. It was indeed like a festival among the departed as they moved up on all sides. It was like a great divine wedding march for me taking place. (laughs) So Carl 
unpacked Elena from her casket and moved her body into the restoration airplane. He called her cabin on the plane, the ship's hospital. Okay. That, that <sighs> plane isn't big enough to have cabin. <laughs> I know it's so small, but like he legit, it's so small, yeah. he legit lived with her in this plane for a period of time. Um, <laughs> a long fuck? period of time. So when he got her there, she had been dead for two years. Her clothes were oh. covered with a slimy mold and her eyes were rotted away. Literally, Kaylin, her no. eyes have been eaten by worms. No. No. Oh no! Oh, I don't, no. Okay, I don't know if anyone has ever heard this yet, but the whole worms eating your eyes from the theme song, that comes from me from like the last yeah. like 10 years of any time anyone's dead. I have just always been like, oh yeah, worms are eating their eyes now. And now this is... It's our inside joke. It's a lot grosser when you it's describe it with yeah. like... A slimy mold, and with with a woman yeah. who like we, we're not so thrilled that worms are eating yeah. her lives, her poor right. short sad yeah. life, her lives. That poor, I mean that poor she, that poor baby. I mean she, she was, was twenty one years old. Like, she was a yeah. baby, and being like and and her body's being like doted after by this like creepy old, man, creepy it's guy. So I hate it. I hate this for Elena. She deserved better. There were maggots on her head, ears, and abdomen. Uh, he bought her glass eyes. He replaced her <laughs> her eaten eyes, um, mm-hmm. and he bought her a bridal gown. Uh, he wrote that she looked beautiful when he draped her with a silk veil, and she was. She told him that she was worried he oh, wouldn't no, love no, no, her no, no, anymore because no, no, she was ugly. Now I don't uh, think that's true, but but he did, and he said, trembling with burning love, I sank gently into the coffin with her and kissed her as if she were alive. Words could not express the heavenly bliss no. that we were experiencing. <laughs> okay, both Mandy Jail. and Kim. No. Jail! 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 Both Jail! Mandy Kim Jail. Are covering their faces right now. Nope. No. I am no look. <laughs> Jail for this man specifically. I am no longer an abolitionist. Just for this fifty-five-year-old, fifty-six-year-old man with a twenty-year-old woman's decaying this, corpse. Just this man. Oh my god. <laughs> Luckily, he's dead now too. Absolutely, empty out oh, all the no. jails of everybody that's in there and put this man in there instead. It was just some Jesus of the word choices in Christ. particular, like trembling, like uh, oh, just you know, uh, he was rock it. hard. He was no. rock hard. <laughs> when he it's why <laughs> no man has ever said my body is trembling. No. Who hasn't been like all of the blood in his body has been relocated to his fucking pelvis? <laughs> oh my god! So he took and examined <laughs> samples from her body and was pleased to find that there was no more tuberculosis. <laughs> well, there is exactly <laughs> one cure for tuberculosis at the time, just and it was dying. You you're it. joking you're <laughs> joking but like legit in his writings about this like he speculates that death cured her of her tb um <laughs> see he's like writing in his notes he's like um the patient post-death seems to no longer be alive curious it's like you're not this I is you're not- her of life. <laughs> and again like well, I, she's not coughing anymore i want to reiterate <laughs> that this is like no, she's not coughing anymore this is written <laughs> so this is part of a memoir that was written by him for a magazine uh so we're dealing with an unreliable narrator here um so it becomes very like murky mm. like how much of this is him being legitimately delusional and how much of this is him spin spinning yeah, like yeah. placing spin right, on, him on the story yeah in order to make himself well, look I feel good. like but i feel like everything's true minus the the ghosts and her talking to him like it seems like that's what he added in to make it seem like oh no she totally wanted it but it's like you're still you're still oh. trembling your way into a coffin the, the things he did the things he did <laughs> happen yeah what what i'm like i don't know if he was delusional uh, delusional enough that he saw ghosts and he saw a corpse talking to him or if he was like after the fact he was like i'm going to make this seem romantic oh, by saying okay. that like she wanted me to do this yeah like all the 
all all the ghosts came out of their yeah. graves to be like, oh, to, they're finally yes, getting together. So, like, <laughs> yeah. we've been waiting yeah. for this. Queen, I love yeah. a young love. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> About time you two settle down, you crazy kids. Yeah. <laughs> that. Exactly that. And in, again, like every time this story is presented, like even by the people who are not supporters of Carl Tanzler, um, which is like kind of a new thing. We'll get to that. Th- this stuff is all presented kind of like without comment. Like I think the people who are not fans of his are like, well, he was clearly very delusional. And I'm like, I don't know how much of it was like delusions and how much of it was his spin yeah. telling his story. Cause he wants to make yeah. himself sound like a romantic hero. Like he was clearly not well, because yeah. he's a corpse. He, he stole a corpse, but like a lot of people have stolen <laughs> sorry, corpses. Like, <laughs> like what makes him different from other people who yeah. have stolen yeah. corpses? <laughs> anyway, he claims he claims in his memoirs that she was healthier than some of his alive patients. <laughs> <laughs> That says a lot more about your practice than it does about your patients. Jesus I Christ. I love that. Like, not, not this she's, gooey, eyeless bride. Dead. Like, <laughs> fucking subtweeting no, himself so hard. No help. This she's whole dead. ass hanging out. In <laughs> what an own. <laughs> like, honestly, she's healthier than some of my patients. She, That's bad, sweetie. She's not, like, you know, coughing anymore. <laughs> She's not, she's not having heart attack. She's not having circulation of blood, ergo. <laughs> I'm sorry, this man. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, that killed he, me. He nearly just, yeah, he nearly just killed you, Mandy. <laughs> and, he, then he would, and then if he found my corpse, he'd be like, oh, wow, she's really healthy. Look at her. She's doing great. Look she's at her. doing good. Hey, this is Editing Hoots here. Hoo-wee. Oh boy, this is turning out to be quite the episode. Uh, I'm going to give you all a break and we're going to throw over to ads. Okay, bye. But not bye. See, see you in a few seconds. Not that many. Like 30, 60, something like that. This story is so gross uh i'm still fucking laughing at that whole thing this story is so gross just she's healthier than some patients of mine like i can't oh that nearly killed me damn like literally go to jail oh so much of this is just like straight up go to jail you want to say hi Um, yes yes i want to say goose Goose oh. Kitty. Oh, Angus. there he is. Oh, look at that Hello, sweetheart. Goosey Goose. He's so sweet. Goose. Hey, Goose. Do you like hearing about corpses? I think that was a yes. <gasps> the, oh, the little guy. guy. Hey. He's just so chill. I love how he just sits like I that. I love Goose. So cute. Oh, my gosh. I wish my, I wish my cats would let me pick them up like a baby. My parents' That's, cat lets me pick him up like a baby. If I try and pick him up any other way, he hates it. But if I do that, he'll just... <laughs> He's a cute That's cute. baby. T- Tantrum baby. hates being picked up. But Murray okay. will let me pick him up. He's just a little bit more, like, ambivalent about it. He doesn't really care. But eventually he will get kind of like, okay, I want to go now. Bye. Oh, my God. Both of my cats are like, please never touch me. Um, <laughs> never touch me. Don't look at me. <laughs> yeah. So, so... Carl Tanzler claimed that Elena was healthier than some of his alive patients and started trying to cure her of her death. (laughs) He, uh, quote, dispensed nourishing fluids to her orally. Don't know what that means. Uh, (laughs) Claiming she gained 20 pounds this way and her wounds started healing. He wrote, quote, even the expression of her face changed to define happiness. She did not require words to express herself. Her face was so much more eloquent than words could be. I mean, I, I, I guess if you keep shoving food into a corpse, it will gain weight. So, like, maybe he's right about that. But. In that there's now food rotting inside the rotting corpse. Right. I'm just imagining, like, a bag that you, yeah. like, you're just shoving shit into. But a human, like, yeah, I guess that would happen. But. And he's like, she's smiling now. I'm like, it's you forced great. her mouth open. Yeah. <laughs> and really, it's just she's decayed enough that yeah. she has like that. <laughs> she's like, exactly. my, this does not work for a podcast, but my girl is like, 
<laughs> yeah. She has like a real blow up doll face yeah. with her little glass eyes. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, ah. oh my God. So he, he made plaster casts of her body and repaired her skin using silk, beeswax, and balsam. He fixed her bones with pieces of piano wire and stapled her hair back onto her skull. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you look beautiful. No, she, she, not this she, hairy she, skull. No. Absolutely so the fuck not. She, no. No. She, no. I won't. She won't. Absolutely she not. Won't. Not this. I think, no. I'm broken. That no, broke me. Uh, That's so, so sick. He, <laughs> Use glue. Oh my god. Excuse me. That's so sick. Use glue. You fucking creep. Like, you use a staple. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but like, get a hot fucking glue gun. Like, like. I mean, that it, is the like, only hey, thing anyway. that's wrong about this is he used staples and but not like, glue. <laughs> Skull. This would be totally okay otherwise. That can't be easier. <laughs> to a rotting just skull. Very inefficient. Like, do you just use the stapler oh. and it creates like a little dent? <laughs> <laughs> no. It just like, oh, not this soft skull. And then like skull. a little worm comes out. No. Like, oh my god. Maggot. Okay. Oh. No. He was, she was definitely filled oh, with maggots. Yeah. Like, <laughs> she was. Maggots. He wrote that she was. Like her whole body. Like he had to clean the <laughs> yeah. maggots off of her. Ugh. Uh-huh. Oh. <laughs> so gross. And I know y'all are wondering about the smell. Oh yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was that was my first <laughs> Do not <laughs> smell <laughs> goose. <laughs> He left after I started screaming about the okay. stable. Goose is like that again. <laughs> oh my they god! Won't get me. <laughs> I know everybody was wondering about the smell. Like so I he, am now. He did address that. He did address the smell. He treated it. <laughs> he treated it with uh, copious disinfectants and perfumes. Uh, the smell of disinfectants. How I want to know romantic. what perfume. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's nothing that gets me in the mood more than the smell of like a, a cancer wing in a hospital. <laughs> like, it's just like he was just. Oh. Took a little bit of Febreze yeah, to that. Bleach. It reminds me of like when I was growing up, we had a collie who kept trying to play with the local skunks. Oh. And we just spray that bastard with <laughs> Febreze and he was fine. He smelled great. Um, I kind of stand that. I do not stand anyone being like, let's Febreze this for Brussy. <laughs> and just brush these maggots off. Where, sorry, where was, where was this body? Florida. Like where in his house? Oh, oh no, no, it was in, in the plane. plane. It, was in the plane. it was in the plane. Oh, there's no circulation in there. No, honey, it that was in that tiny s- little plane. Janky plane. Mm. Yeah. Sometime during the restoration process, uh, the U.S. Marine Hospital. Restoration is a. <laughs> it's like uh, not the right word. <laughs> so the the hospital where he worked, the administration changed, and he was told he could no longer keep his plane on the property of the hospital. Because remember, it's still at the hospital. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> It's so yeah. close to people. If they went into that plane, <laughs> it's yeah. so close to people. <laughs> I'm sorry. Every time he opened it, people were like, "Oh my god, what is that smell?" And he's like, "My wife, you <laughs> asshole!" I'm sorry. I just, in my head, I was imagining this um, this plane and and him and this whole thing happening like in the middle of the fucking woods somewhere. But this is like no, a no. hospital. It's in a public parking you know what? lot. Oh, they would. They're gonna get sued. Low key, <laughs> low key, kind of smart though. Like because like if yeah. people did smell a bad smell and next to a 1930s tuberculosis hospital, they'd probably be like, well, sounds about yeah. right. It smells like tuberculosis. And probably any chemicals that he needed, he could just get from there, basically. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's actually pretty genius. Probably. There's no way that he was buying oh, no. these himself. He was going into the storeroom and was like... Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. He was definitely stealing them. So... He moved the plane to the beach and he wrote of it's so romantic. Elena's family. <laughs> Sorry, beachside property. I can't. Okay, I need to put my drink down for the rest of this episode. One. <laughs> so when he moved the plane, he wrote of Elena's family waving at him. Uh, <laughs> he was inside the plane as it moved, cheering him on, having no idea that her body was inside. <gasps> this piece of shit. Okay, so they were like, bye, leave. We're so glad you're gone, not knowing. Yeah. 
They were like waving him. They were like, Goodbye. oh my God. And and meanwhile, they think that their daughter is finally at like, rest. And he's oh like, no. he is the weird guy who like paid for her funeral, who like got super obsessed with her for a while, but now he's kind of left them right. alone. So they're like, well, but yeah, didn't he's he moving publish to publish that right. stuff later? Didn't he? Later. Okay. Oh, I was have... like, did they not like read that? But okay. No, much Those later. Poor, that, that poor family. That poor family. So, uh, <sighs> yeah. And, and in some tellings that I've heard of this tale, the person who helped him tow it was her brother in law. Fuck off. So, very cool and good. <laughs> Fuck this guy. So, at his new, at his new beachfront property with his <laughs> wife he built a shack with a laboratory and a hangar for the plane where he could continue his work resurrecting elena what kind of shack has a fucking hangar <laughs> such a bougie shack i'm like oh this is my shack i have a, I this think... is the laboratory <laughs> this is my plane hangar like... i have a feeling airplane hangar in this instance just means a shack big enough to fit that tiny little fucking airplane <laughs> He played music for her because it was, quote, a means to apply the cosmic laws of vibration through harmonic sound waves. Cool. Of course, yeah. Ve- science, like, science. Yoga stuff. Okay. Like, definitely yeah. very California, very, like, Topanga Canyon <laughs> kind of stuff, even though this is Florida. He soaked Elena in, quote, a liquid plasma incubator and applied electrical currents to her body. So just the same stuff he was doing to her while she was alive. Liquid plasma uh, He incubator. loves to shock a bitch. I mean, he shocked this bitch several times. Mm. <laughs> like, both dead and alive. Oh, sorry, I meant me because oh, he is bitch. I'm this bitch. <laughs> I, I have been, I have been shocked and shook at by this man. <laughs> you want to be shocked and shook it again? So he brought her oh, some no. wine for Christmas. It's like a little Christmas present. <laughs> Quote: I drank half of it and drew the other half into my mouth. I pressed my lips <gasps> firmly against hers, which were open just a little. Thus, slowly, I forced the wine into her mouth. Absolutely <laughs> the fuck not. Just you baby know, birding her. <laughs> baby birding her as a maggot swims upstream. Like, <laughs> I'm going to lose my shit. This is the grossest story I have ever fucking heard. Oh, my God. Oh, I, oh, I really am just gagging right now. No, no, shit, no. <laughs> this is why I didn't want to go last today. Oh, yeah, God. that's fair. No, we all would have been having fucking nightmares. <laughs> oh, my God. I... Are you okay, Mandy? Mandy legit. Uh, Mandy will like, never be okay yeah. again. Mandy, <laughs> Mandy was like holding her temples. I saw her, I saw her eyes throw up. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> They did. Like, I legitimately had, like, a little gorge start to come up for a second. I was like, oh, no, no. <laughs> Sorry. Like, that was just, oh, uh, that's, fuck this man. Jesus. Oh, uh, Why does he keep doing this to us? So, uh, Carl moved again from, from his shack to another home uh, in before the summer of 1936 and uh, claimed that Elena had started to wake up and move her fingers and turn her head slightly to gaze at him. At this time. So Carl uh, was was pleased with her improvement and uh, moved her into his bed. (laughs) (laughs) Quote, no, they don't have washing and washers and dryers at this point. I mean, I would say I think he's washing them by hand. But Kaylin, I don't think he's washing those sheets at all. No. A man who lives with a corpse probably doesn't worry about washing (laughs) his sheets that much. Yeah. It's like, wow, these sheets smell like a corpse that's so romantic (laughs) like Mm, mm. the disinfectant smell (laughs) oh quote now i slept by her side to be close to her and protect her from insects and other dangers as if i could feel it for her whenever i discovered another leakage (gasps) i sealed it up right away with silk and wax to stop any plasma from running away She's leaking. Not him white knighting for She's her leaking. against maggots. She's leaking in the bed. <sighs> oh, she is God. at this point, like, her body has got to be, like, liquefied under yeah. this, like, silk and beeswax barrier that he's just, yeah. like, built for her. Like, I don't know how much body is actually left. Oh, no. And little chunks are, like, popping uh, off on the sides. And he's, like, sealing uh, it up. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> he's sham 
wowing it. <laughs> <laughs> these like a, these little maggots, white water rafting down in her liquid plasma, just like uh, we're free. free. And he's like, no, get back in there. Oh god, that's so, I can't. So uh, oh, this is a person. Yeah, this is a like, human being a, who like, lived. A, I don't believe in the soul, so it doesn't really make a difference to me whether or not someone's alive or dead. Like, bodily autonomy, like, keeps going because exactly. it's not like they're God now. Like, oh Yeah. And, th- like, this is the challenge for this episode because, again, like, uh, in my mind, at least, because I don't really believe in an afterlife, the only thing that I'm thankful for is Elena doesn't know yeah. what happened to her after death. Mm. But I do feel like well, we do. it is a uh, massive injustice, mm-hmm. injustice yeah. um, that happened to her. Yep. And I believe that um, to an extent, bodily autonomy extends beyond someone's natural life. Yeah. And this is a violation of her yep. autonomy as a woman who once lived. Yep. Um, and I, I hate this man for it. Mm-hmm. I legit hate this man. I, I understand it, why you did the premise uh, or the, the like yeah. little like preface yeah, at the beginning because I imagine while looking into this um you probably found some like very like unkind things said that really like sort of um mm. did not like are we're talking about her as if like she was an object yeah like I I don't know what you ran into so, but like I can imagine a lot of people telling this story we're really here for the like squick factor the spin on this story for um most of the time since it happened until about 2017 when actually this american life did an episode about this story um that and oh, okay. it, like because it was 2017 it coincided with like the me too era and people started to re-examine this story yeah. for the majority of the time that people have told this story um since it happened it has been told like a romantic epic and i grew up in florida and i remember this story i remember it being like the story of the man whose love was so strong that even death couldn't take his love away from him what gets Mm. eliminated from this story is like she Elena is literally objectified in that like her own wishes and desires and the fact that she repeatedly turned him down Mm -hmm. are of little consequence. The only thing that matters is that he, she was beautiful and he loved her. And he wanted her. He wanted to contain her. It's not like this is a. He wanted to own her. He wanted to possess her. It's not like a, a a love story that, that like uh, continues after death. It's not like, oh, death couldn't even stop their love. Yeah. It's like yeah. consent couldn't even There's stop nothing, she, nothing, never loved like, him. she never loved him. <laughs> and all that shit that... No, like, she was even nice enough to call him no. her friend. But I don't think she meant that. I think that's what you say to the crazy because person. Because he was attempting yeah. to save her life. That's what you say to yep. the person who is treating you're you. You're like, oh, well, thank you so much for your help, yeah, my absolutely. friend. And you hope that they will eventually pick yeah, up on the you're, fucking you're like, you're <laughs> yeah, you are dropping a major hit. And you say, I d- I'm sorry, I can't I can't marry you because you're old enough to be my grandfather. And, and also, I'm already married. And then he's just like, but I would marry you if you were a mummy. And <laughs> I'd marry like, you if you what? were my grandfather. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. It's like, <laughs> okay. Like, the fact that he includes in his story, regardless of whether or not, you know, this actually happened in his delusions, about how she said, like, oh, uh, how can you still love me even though I'm ugly? Oh like, that God. feels very deliberate in my mind of, like, Oh, uh, like yeah. almost like a call back to that part. Yeah. Like, see, I did still love her even when she wasn't as attractive because she's a rotting corpse now. What, literally when she was a mummy. <laughs> yeah. When she's yeah. Little, yeah uh, like so gross. Which again, like that is, okay. like, I've had the same thought and I'm like, I, even the people who now have started to re-examine the story have done it through like, this guy was clearly deranged. And, and obviously anybody who like, takes a corpse and puts it in their fucking plane is deranged to an extent right is not but mentally well details of the story <laughs> yeah, but d- deranged is not the yeah, same as details, like, <laughs> like those kind of details of the Sorry, story yeah. like oh I, i'm worried that you won't love me anymore feel very um tailored and very like um they, they mm. sound workshop oh, it yeah. sounds like he was like i need to make myself yeah it's a little watt patty yeah i need to sound like, like i'm the romantic hero in my story here and i'm gonna yeah. put some spin on yeah. it so i don't actually think that he was um as 
detached from reality as a lot of modern people who who talk about the story do. And the yeah. this is kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but like the psychologists at the time who examined him agreed with me. They they determined that he was sane. Yeah. But we'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. So uh by 1940, about seven years after Carl removed Elena from her tomb, oh people started to get suspicious. <laughs> seven, <laughs> seven years. <laughs> they started to go, hey, that smelly guy who really smells like bleach. So this is a little oh off. Oh my <laughs> God. Not, what was his name? Something doctor? <laughs> Carl, uh, Carl, uh, we know it was uh, Dr. Count Carl von Kosel is what he called uh, himself. That, that Dr. Yeah. Count doesn't um, seem legit. <laughs> Dr. Count. That Dr. Count uh, always is brushing maggots off his, off the, off his shoulders. Yeah. Like, it's very weird, but. You know, he's always suggesting that I should drink like gold for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the one of the initial things that made people kind of suspicious, like right away, um, before the seven skeleton. years passed, uh, no, was the <laughs> fact that like for eighteen months he visited her visited her mausoleum like every single and night, then he stopped and then going. suddenly stopped. Yeah. So people were like, "That's weird." That's suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> That's weird. Uh, but he also continued buying. He continued buying gifts for a young woman. So it was like, well, did he meet somebody else or is something else going on? Mm. And then uh, after seven years had passed and he moved to his new home, a neighbor boy claimed to have seen Carl through the window of his house one night dancing with a life-sized doll. <laughs> Both of your jaws just hit the floor. Oh, because she was so It's like that scene in Home Alone. Yeah. No. With the silhouettes on yeah. the window yeah. and the and the the cardboard cutouts, except for it's yeah. a life size silk beeswax woman. <laughs> yep, with stapled hair. So <laughs> stapled hair. So by this time, by 1940, uh, tuberculosis. By this time, <laughs> by 1940, tuberculosis had slowly picked off every member of Elena's family one by one, except for her sister, Florinda. Oh. Is that the one that told him to stop dreaming? I think so. Um, so okay. Florinda would also eventually succumb to the illness not long after this. Like it, it wiped out her whole family, which is why we have. <sighs> That's so sad. We have no record of what they thought about anything. <sighs> yeah. That's... Yeah. So Florinda, by 1940, was the last person left. Uh, she went by Nana or Nanya quite often. So Nana confronted Carl and told him to open up the mausoleum Good. for her because she had some suspicions that her sister was not in the mausoleum. Yeah. And at first he refused, mm -hmm. but then uh, Nana took on As like you do. <laughs> uh, Nana took on like a, a little bit of a like sympathetic like pleading kind of attitude mm -hmm. and was like, I just want to see my sister again. So Carl said, all right, stop by the house later. Mm -hmm. And no, we're having a tea party. She did. <gasps> he brought Nana into the bedroom, drew back the curtain. Why was there a curtain? And oh, no, showed no, no, her no, no, no. this. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I know that was not the important part of the story, but I'm like, did this bitch have a canopy bed? Like, <laughs> no. Oh, honey, she had a mosquito net. I she had a mosquito oh, net because the bugs kept eating her. Oh my god, you're right. Okay. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. The Kaylee, just the way you said that was just so funny. Is this photo you sent real? Oh, no. What is this? Oh, yes. what's this photo? This is... I haven't opened it yet. Here we this go. This is her. <gasps> oh, no. <gasps> she looks like a district manager <laughs> at a local retail <laughs> chain. Oh, Wait, my can, God. Do you... <laughs> do you just remember like do you remember what she looked like alive not like this not like this and this is what she looks like now that is not her face that's <gasps> he just made a whole other yeah. woman <laughs> with her inside all gooey like the most terrible kinder yeah. surprise <laughs> I'm sorry, Mandy. I just, I, I couldn't stop looking and I came back and Mandy was like bent over. <laughs> what the fuck is this? 
She looks it's like a fucking horrible. pinata. It's horrible. <laughs> Okay, I don't know if the listeners normally go look up these photos, but you have to look this up. I will. I'll put it in the Instagram. I'll put it in the Instagram post. You have, you so have to look at this photo. It is so disturbing. It is. So, Her hair is like is literally terif- falling off. He, he missed a lot of it. It's stapled on. He Kevin. missed a lot of it. It doesn't look like a fucking real person no. in any sense. It legit it looks, looks like a pinata. You, you were spot on there. <laughs> it looks like a pinata <laughs> of like a, a young picture. gay man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. She oh looks like it, I'm getting district manager. I, if she had a chunky necklace on, like 100, percent I would say that she is the district manager was, of a Boston pizza. And just like scroll up the very last image that I dropped just before that was like her while she was still alive. Look at that beautiful woman, and look what he turned her into. Yeah, I still have that open. I know. Not that it would be oh any less God, sad. Not that, that it would be any less woman. sad if she wasn't beautiful. But like, look at what he did to her. Look what he did to my girl. Like, and imagine. No, okay. okay. The fact that he's like, I, he's like, I, she looks even more like healthy than before. <laughs> right. And it's like that, that <laughs> it's because it, it, she's inside of Jesus that. Jesus Christ. Like the, he made a, like a paper mache yeah. woman around her yeah. corpse. And now I understand why she right. was springing <laughs> leaks. She was just dissolving like, inside of, of it. Of the, out. Pop. And like, imagine you're her sister. He, and you're already like weirded okay. out by the fact that he's like, come to the house. Like, uh, okay, and whatever. I'll see her. And I'll, and you get there, and he pulls this curtain, and then you're just like, oh, <laughs> this is a paper mache replica of my sister. What the uh-huh. fuck is this? Like, you don't even probably recognize it first. Okay, it's her but corpse. Do you know why the chunks were blowing out? <laughs> and that was exactly her yeah. reaction. The gas. That was exactly her reaction. At first, yeah. he, at first, she thought he had made a doll of her, and then yeah. after she looked at her for a few more moments. And she realized that her corpse the was gas inside. spilled up in there, and so she she left. <laughs> but like that's why the, the that's also why the chunks would blow out because like the uh. amount of pressure that would build up, like the, like I guess methane. I'm I'm no corpseologist, but it had to have smelled so bad, even with the perfume and disinfectant. And also, he's that must be bad for him, like yeah. constantly like smelling and like. Like breathing oh, in all I'm that sure. fumes from the like, chemicals yeah, that could not like, have been I'm healthy pretty, for him. <laughs> like it's entirely possible he was also a little bit high off of whatever the fuck yeah. that was. Like if he's just like laying in bed next to like a a Glade plug-in filled with formaldehyde. Like, Good. I hope it kills him faster. I hope so too. <laughs> like fuck him. Ah, oh, Jesus. Yeah, I'm like you were tripping the fuck out because you were yeah. like, <laughs> uh, right? Okay. Maybe he was listening a bit, a yeah. little bit. Okay. Uh, imagining her yeah. moving her fucking lips constantly breathing in bleach dude Ugh. so a few days later the police arrived <laughs> and <arrested Carl. laughs> good job Nana. like like a cab and i'm a prison abolitionist but please please come and take this man to fucking jail <laughs> <laughs> please take him away take him away uh also okay a cab addendum. They took her body to uh, the Lopez funeral home where it was uh, put on display and like 6,000 people came oh. and looked at her body. Oh, no. How did they know. make it? I mean, I shouldn't be so surprised that the police A-Cab made things worse. Stands. Yeah. A yeah. cab yeah. Like that. squared now. Let that poor woman rest. Like, uh, <laughs> they were like, you're going to want to see this shit. You're going to want to see this human <laughs> pinata. <laughs> okay, now that someone else said pinata, I can see why it's funny. <laughs> Like the most I don't accurate hear my description own, I don't listen to myself, I've ever heard. So I don't hear my own jokes until someone says it back. <laughs> but uh, I'm, okay, you're, no. you're gonna love the surprise when you break it open. <laughs> <laughs> Carl was charged with, quote, wantonly and maliciously demolishing, disfiguring, and destroying a grave. (laughs) Demolishing. (laughs) The story of Carl and his corpse bride got picked up by gossip columns, and the public largely took a sympathetic position on Carl, characterizing him as an eccentric romantic who was offered free legal representation and strangers paid his $1,000 bail. Fuck off. Oh, fuck that. Mm -hmm. I want their names. I'm going to dox their grandbabies. That poor family. So yeah. now after all of that, I mean, granted, I guess it's only the sisters left, mm-hmm. but <sighs> Jesus. In court, Carl denied that he engaged in necrophilia, saying no, and then adding ominously, she was mummified. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Like, end? 
He wrote like the like the uh, that- the judge was like, "Did you sexually molest this corpse?" And he went, "No." She was mummified. It's like and I tried, but um, I'm really good at my <laughs> wax work. <laughs> like, I if it's in your bed and it's a corpse. Uh, it's necrophilia. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. Yeah. And the doctors who performed the autopsy on Elena remarked that her breasts felt real. Oh, my. Um, and her vaginal cavity had a tube inserted in it <gasps> with cotton packed at the bottom of the tube. And upon examination of the cotton, the doctors confirmed that the cotton had sperm on it. Fuck off. So he was fucking her. He was fucking Did, her. Was yeah. this brought was up in her. court? Of course he was. Was this brought up in court? Yes. Like, are they, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and are there uh, court transcripts? Um, I th- think there are. I think that's where these quotes come from, but I couldn't find them. The like the sicko, like a uh, true crime, like ex murderino in me is like I need to see I need these to court read transcripts. All of I'm these. like, Kellen, why don't you go take a fucking bath instead? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think they're at like most of these documents, uh, including like the letters and stuff, are like at a museum in Key West. In Nana's testimony, she pled with the judge, Your Honor, it was the most grotesque thing I've ever seen in my life. Her hair was still on her head. She had glass eyes. Her arms and legs were like sticks with stockings. It was a monster. It was horrible. What I saw will haunt me for the rest of my life. Carl was told that Elena's new resting place would be a secret. And he was very mad about that. Of course he was. He said... I resurrected her. I brought her back to life, Your Honor. I will carry the fight to the highest courts of the land if I live long enough to obtain sufficient funds to regain her. She is mine. Her father gave her to me, which, no, he did not. No, he did not. I am more entitled to her than her sister. Entitled. He used the fucking word entitled. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean. I hate him. That specific word feels accurate. I love this man. I hate him so much. I'm so glad this man's dead. Fuck this man. I hate him. Fuck this man so I hate him. I hate him. There are very few people we've done so far that I literally would have killed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but like, I, I I, would have killed this man if given the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Like, fucking, fucking monster. I'm like, Absolute monster. I'm like, bring back the death penalty <laughs> maybe too. Like all of my morals are going like right the fuck out the window. Just thinking about this one fucking man. I want to hit because, this like, man with a brick. <sighs> yeah. Ooh. Yeah. No. A good brickin' uh, sounds good. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Marsha P. I'm a Marsha P. Stonewall. This man. Yes. <laughs> so, as I alluded to earlier, a court-appointed physician determined that Carl was mentally quote in a borderline state, characterized by certain obsessions with other uh, actions being normal, and that he was fit to stand trial. So, like, they determined that he was sane, but he mm-hmm. got like very obsessive about. Basically just her. Like, this was the only time where he had, yeah. like, mental breaks. Mm-hmm. But eventually all charges against Carl Tansler were dropped due to the statute of limitations on the crime having expired. Because, like... How? Abusing a corpse is only, like, a year. And he took her body, like, seven years before. But he ke- he kept... But he still had it. But he kept having it. So when it's, it wouldn't, like, refresh every time? Like, no. He doesn't pass- the crimes are the grave. Oh, but the crimes yeah. were, were desecrating and demolishing Which the grave. Which seven years prior to, previously. Yeah. That's annoying. So after his release, Carl Tanzler became a minor Florida celebrity and he sold his story to a magazine, which is how we have all of the quotes from him today, and gave tours of his laboratory to the public Fuck for 25 off. cents. Deprived of Elena's actual body, he built an effigy of her that he lived <gasps> with until his death in Zephyr Hills, Florida in 1952. Tansler biographer Ben Harrison hypothesized in his book, Undying Love, that Tansler's time in the Australian internment camp may have led to his deteriorating mental state. Quote, indeed, if these traumatic memories are at all accurate, one may theorize that this interval of imprisonment may have caused the triggering mechanism for post-traumatic stress syndrome, causing Ven Kosel's later agitated mental states and altering his sense of reality, but also his theories of life, death, and spirit. And that's just a biographer's opinion. I He is not a... Yeah, that's just some guy. uh, Yeah, he's not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Yeah. Maria Elena Milagro de Hoyo's final resting place is unknown. Good. Her body was dismembered, put into an 18-inch box, and buried in a secret location chosen by the Key West chief of police at the time, Bienvenido Perez, 
uh, Benjamin Sawyer of the Lopez Funeral Home, and Cemetery Sexton Otto Bethel. The three men took the secret of the location of Elena's grave to their own graves. Thank you to those men. Thank you to those three woman. men for like doing the one like solid thing in this. Yeah, her her grave if it had continued to be like a fucking tourist attraction yeah. would have so like it, broken yeah. my stupid heart yeah no i'm gl- i'm glad no one knows because that that's good yeah. good you know good for elena yeah yeah i'm glad she finally gets to rest i know um, like ugh, just to it, same yeah i'm glad good on, good on those men yeah and to that point I just want to finish this out. I know this has run a little bit long. I want to finish the story out with a quick related anecdote. On August 4th, 1962, Norma Jean Mortensen, otherwise known as Marilyn Monroe, died of acute barbiturate poisoning in her Brentwood home. The death was ruled a probable suicide as she had emptied several bottles of pills and was several times over the lethal limit. Uh, Monroe had had a long history of substance abuse and mental illness and had made previous attempts on her life. Monroe had led a tragic life, sexually and mentally abused for much of her childhood. Her meteoric rise to fame in the post-war era was marred by a troubled personal life and the hypersexualization and iconization of her image. When she died, the front page of the New York Mirror infamously read, Marilyn Monroe kills self, found nude in bed, hand on phone, took 40 pills. Eight years before Monroe's death in 1954, a businessman named Richard Poncher purchased the crypt above Marilyn Monroe's from Joe DiMaggio. DiMaggio had purchased the two crypts in Westwood Village Memorial Park Cemetery following his marriage to Monroe earlier that year, but the couple divorced after only nine months, and DiMaggio sold his crypt to Poncher. In 1986, Poncher died, and his wife had him buried at his request face down in his crypt so that he could spend eternity laying on top of Marilyn Monroe in an intimate repose. Poncher's widow, Elsie, recounted her husband's last request to the LA Times, quote, he said, if I croak, if you don't put me upside down over Marilyn, I'll haunt you for the rest of my life. In 2017, Hugh Hefner was buried in the crypt next to Monroe. He purchased the crypt in 1992 for $75,000 and is quoted in the LA Times as saying, I'm a believer in things symbolic. Spending eternity next to Marilyn is too sweet to pass up. Infamously, Hefner, who had never actually met Monroe, published a nude photo of her in the first edition of Playboy without her permission. In Marilyn in her own words, Monroe revealed, quote, I never even received a thank you from all those who made millions off a nude Marilyn photograph. I even had to buy a copy of the magazine to see myself in it. Leaked nudes are now considered a sex crime under the legal systems of many nations. Marilyn Monroe spent a lifetime being sexually abused and sexualized and spent much of her very short life miserable precisely because of this sex symbol status. And even in death, her remains were likewise sexualized and commodified against her wishes or consent by two men she had never even met. It is only a small comfort that because she is dead, she can't bear witness to this last great humiliation. And I want to end on that. Mm. Okay, so earlier I was going to tweet men with that like emoji, the like red emoji, the like panting one with the the water drops. <laughs> and now I'm I'm an incel again. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I'm deleting my dating like, apps Jesus again. fucking Christ. Yeah, that was, what if I feel like you just hit me with a brick too. <laughs> <laughs> it's so grim. An and emotional brick. I like... I, again, like I want to stand by my desire to shit talk the dead because the dead can't hear you and can't care. But I do think that we um, need to care about what happens to the remains of dead people because I do think that that is yeah. a bodily autonomy mm-hmm. thing. And I think it's important to note whose bodily autonomy most often gets stripped. Yeah. Yep. Which is, it's women. It's straight women. up. And that's like women. There, there's um, a lot of uh, really fucked colonial shit mm-hmm. that goes yeah. on with, with people uh, of color displaying the corpses. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that That's where I thought we were going originally when you said this. I didn't yeah. know any any of yeah. this story because i mean like um, i'm like that's elena a, was a woman of color um and uh, i mean like marilyn monroe was a, yeah. a white woman but it's uh yeah it's very often uh women it's very often um uh indigenous people it's very often 
uh, black people who yeah. have had horrible things uh, done to their bodies after death. Like it's it's always marginalized yeah. people mm-hmm. whose remains are uh, most often desecrated. And um, yeah, it's just like one again. They're, they're they're dead. They don't know what's happening to them. But like it is one last great humiliation and desecration, and it boils my blood yeah because anyone i mean you don't need to be alive to know that to to see that and then know that your body Mm -hmm. is you you have you don't have autonomy Mm -hmm. over it Mm -hmm. that even in death you don't have an escape like that is a like i don't think it's meant to be a threat but it is a threat like to to everyone who has a body similar to that person and like, there's a huge difference between saying somebody was a shitty person after they're dead and like literally digging up their fucking corpse. Like, I know we joke about that. Like we dug up their corpse and dragged them for you, but like- but we didn't literally do it. But No, but we would not actually do that. Number one, I don't dig. Like, like... <laughs> the physical label part alone is, is not- Yeah, I'm like, absolutely the fuck not. I'm not going to go out and buy a shovel for this. Number two, I find- uh, All of that completely disgusting. The thought of a man like thinking it's funny and cute Mm -mm. to be buried laying face down over a Marilyn Monroe. No. Yeah. So gross. Is it's just like like such a perfect encapsulation of like rape culture, right? Like it's like this is like a funny, cute joke. Mm hmm. And she doesn't know what's happening. And, but we all do. Because she's no longer with us. It's, it's insulting. I don't think they would care even if she did. It's, I think it's almost more insulting for those of us who are alive to hear about it because we know what he's trying to do. Yeah. We know the joke the joke he's trying to make, the entitlement he feels or someone like Carl feels. I think that's what makes it so gross. It's like it's not just the fact that you would do that to someone who's dead. Like, yeah, they're just dead. Like, it yeah. doesn't necessarily matter to them anymore, but it matters to us because we know like, oh, if I'm dead, someone might do that to me because they just don't care about me. They don't mm-hmm. think about the fact that I was someone's daughter, someone's sister like that that i was a person i think it's just that level of that i was a person yeah like just like a literal person it's a level of disrespect that's just like it's just so gross Mm -hmm. and needless it's just so it's so unnecessary and and he literally even said i was entitled Mm -hmm. to her like he said that he fucking he said the quiet part out loud and it's just like oh we're still gonna fucking cheer for this man or snicker at the guy being put face down above Marilyn like yeah. fuck that that's it's so gross I hate it uh, and admittedly I'm probably I, I, the fact that we're talking about this so recently after the Roe v Wade um, situation because Hoots and I are obviously in the United States yeah. um, I think that also makes this kind of hit harder too it's a little oh, bit absolutely. it's just it's all part of the same culture it's yeah. all part of the same like yeah uh, uh, disrespect and like um, the mm-hmm. the uh, the stratifying uh, like the, the 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 making anybody who is femme like a second class citizen like yeah yeah we're we're not humans and in the same way that like elena was never a human being to carl she was an object to possess no. yeah. she she was a dream she which is he, why she he was, was a just, fantasy he was just as happy to have her corpse as yep. to have yeah. her alive which is, is yeah, so telling who she was did not matter she was this this thing he could dote upon it and, and put up on a pedestal and like remember when this started out as like she was a ghost friend of yeah. his mm-hmm yeah like <laughs> which then, again like, <laughs> like that story is always told as if like yeah, it's complete bullshit it's like yeah taken at face value like oh he used to have visions of a woman and then he met elena and assumed that that was the woman and it's like no he told the story of the visions after the fact when he sold his story to a magazine to romanticize yeah. it to, to, he never yeah. had those fucking visions it, it, what are you talking about it makes it it gives it that um and I know that we're like harping on this now, but like it, it, it gives it that air of like, a pre, like, I don't know if predestination is a yeah, word. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it's like, it's, it's like destiny. we are fated to be together. Yeah. Like, like uh, she came from me beyond the grave um, to, to then be alive. Mm-hmm. And then I had her from beyond the grave again. Like it's like our our love story spans like yeah. li- like multiple lifetimes. She was lifetimes. always meant like, to be mine. Yeah, that was her destiny. Was yeah. to always be owned by me. <sighs> so gross. And I'm so glad he's dead. I wish he had never lived. Me too. And I wish, oh my god. I yeah. wish mm-hmm. 
Like if I could have it my way, Elena would have had a, a long, nice life and Carl would have fucking died at birth. Yeah. Um, well, I... Yeah, birth would have been good a little mm-hmm. bit before. Carl would have been a, a semen splatter on a fucking bear coat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Callbacks. <laughs> oh, no. Just like Carl Carl getting steam cleaned out at the dry cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to say who it's like. I so like I always love hearing these stories, obviously, because I get to learn about somebody, you know, and, and have this great conversation with you both. But I especially appreciate you bringing this to our attention who it's because you're, you're literally saying like this woman's voice we don't have it we don't have our family's voice so i'm gonna do my best to try and present the story in the way that i think is probably the reality and i think you did a really good job at that of like kind of you know yeah. showing some respect we disrespect a lot of the dead here but we do not disrespect elena here and i think you did a really good job mm. of that um not to be like super serious yeah, on she's our not the dead we want to disrespect podcast, but like seriously <laughs> i think you did a really good job so i, I really appreciate that you thank you are sharing that story and hopefully yeah. this helps our I, listeners know the truth too maybe some of them have heard the more sympathetic version of this so that might might help them out too yeah i feel like it, it must have been given that sort of um like man falls in love with pigeon kind of vibe where it's like <laughs> it's just like oh, i was just a harmless <laughs> old man yeah. who oh yeah who just or like the woman that fell in love with a train or whatever the fuck <laughs> like like this but yeah like the person who fell in love with yeah, the eiffel tower or but whatever this is, yeah um i think i i don't think um i could have done this story the justice with the like empathy and heart that who thank did. you um again it's, mm. it's always been present i grew Great. up in florida so i was familiar with this story before the kind of like 2017 re-examination of it following the this american life episode thanks ira glass or whoever the fuck i know right um i don't remember who actually was in charge of that episode <laughs> um but uh, I, I just know like around 2017, 2018, people started talking about this again. So I, I was familiar with this before and it was always like presented as a romance. And like it was it was meant to be like definitely in like the the Southern Gothic yeah. tradition where like ooh, it's kind of spooky and weird, but he's not a villain. He's like an Edgar Allan Poe figure. Oh, right. Fuck off. Yeah, and I'm. Uh, it makes me so mad. Yeah, it's gross. <laughs> yeah, no, should like, be. And even again, in the reexaminations of it, I feel like people are too kind to him. I feel like he was um, a piece of shit yep. who tried to make himself seem more delusional than he actually was in order to justify his actions. Oh, one hundred percent. I mm-hmm. and I'm willing to say that anybody who says otherwise is like you're we're in apologia now mm-hmm. like like it there's no mm-hmm. i'm like there's no excuse regardless if you, like, you can be as fucking mentally unstable as you want i am <laughs> but i'm still always making sure that like the things that i do like are actually justified yeah. and i don't like after the fact blame my my issues on or blame like my actions on my issues. Like there's there's no justification for that. And anyone that's like, oh, he was just like a deranged old man. Yeah. Like I I don't know how many deranged old men have corpses in their beds. Very very few. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wanted to do my I wanted to do my do, due diligence by like sharing the biographer's hypothesis that he had PTSD from when he was uh, in internment, and I do believe that like while he was in internment, that must have been seriously traumatic because he was yeah. in an, he was in a concentration camp. Yeah. Uh, however. Uh, corpse fucking is not a symptom of post-traumatic stress <laughs> Sorry, disorder. Sorry, just the phrase like, corpse fucking gets me every time because it's so shocking. It does make me want to ask, like, how many other people from that internment camp went on to fuck a corpse to deal with the trauma? You and, know, like And how? electroshock alive people. Like, yeah, they're, that they're, too. Every, everything, he did, everything he did, everything he did was lies and bullshit. Yeah. And I think just like mm-hmm. L. Ron Hubbard, the mm. there are so many things that are um so many stories and so many like like the the mythos is created after the fact mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. account and to explain away and to justify some like really reprehensible actions and absolutely I'm willing yeah. to also brick anyone who defends him. The bricks for everyone, <laughs> baby. <laughs> this is for Elena. <laughs> bricks for all. All right. 
I'm calling this one. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Very okay. fair. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Respect the Dead. You can follow Respect the Dead on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Respect the Dead. If you want to follow us individually, you can find our socials in the show notes. And you should check out our YouTube channels. We don't shit on dead people there as often, but still, we're making tons of cool stuff. If you enjoyed Respect the Dead and would like to support us, there's a couple of ways to do that. You can give us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you found us. If you leave us a review, we can read it out on the podcast. Reviews are the best way for new listeners to discover the show. Give us at least five stars and then share us with a good friend who likes venting about dead people. You can also give us some money over on our Patreon. Patreon supporters get some cool bonus content like bloopers from the cutting room floor and even coming up with a fake sponsor ad that we'll read in an episode. It has to be a fake business though, not your MLM, honey. Thanks so much for listening. Join us every Monday for our next Worm Feast. I'm Kellen Conrad. I'm Ailey Mandy. And I'm Hoots. Bye. Bye. Bye.